Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Wandering Road Podcast. I'm your host, Chris, alongside my co-host, Dean. And joining us for today's show is a listener who is also an author, a former podcaster, and a former radio host, Ryan, joining us today on the show. How you doing, Ryan? I'm doing awesome. Glad to have you on the show. Uh, what's awesome is you reached out to us via email saying you had some spooky stories from your time living in New Mexico and Missouri. And there's also a La Llorona encounter that we might get into later on in the episode. So I'm really looking forward to this one. So yeah, I used to live in Albuquerque. We live in the South Valley. So I don't know if anybody's been there before, but South Valley is like, think like Breaking Bad territory to where they, they filmed Los Pueblos Hermanos was like right around the street from where I lived. So that was pretty cool. But anyways, the casita that my my then wife and I were living in was super haunted. I had a shadow person there. And like every evening, this corner, it would get super dark. You know how like when the sun sets, the shadows move in the room, but that shadow wouldn't move. And it was terrifying. It was, I would wake up like feeling it standing over me. Like I wasn't sleeping well. I tried everything that I could think of to you know get rid of it it wasn't till i did um smudging and staging that i was able to get it to go away at what point when you noticed that figure standing over you did you realize that it wasn't moving with the the rest of the shadows in the room to me that's like a pretty astute perception there like you know it might take some time to realize that was it kind of like immediate that you noticed like oh this thing actually is staying static or was it pretty instantaneous it was pretty instantaneous and also the feel would change it would get really heavy i don't know how to describe it but like something evil was there staring at you and i couldn't for the longest time make it go away whatever that thing was you said it was evil yeah would it just sit in the corner and just stare at y'all or it was really tall too it gotta be at least we had vaulted ceilings then so it was gotta be at least seven feet tall kind of slender it would appear like clockwork every evening did you happen to notice any weird movements like when when it would stand over you did you feel like it was trying to get something or elicit something from you or did, was it kind of just like a towering menace that that uh was trying to freak you out it was like a towering menace sort of thing and i have no idea why it appeared i have no idea why it started to you know do all that stuff all i know is that we were living on a really old piece of land this is like where the conquistadors came through so like lots of stuff has happened there So I don't know if it had anything to do with that, but we were also living by, you know, like really old, uh, in New Mexico, they're they're called acequias. They're like drainage ditches that have been built by the Spanish and they're still being used. And, um, but yeah, something about every evening it would just pop up and it would not leave me alone. We've never actually talked to somebody who had such a experience that where something just popped up in their room suddenly and you just kind of didn't know what was going on. Cause like a lot of people had some kind of framework for, for building up to that, but this seems like it just dropped into your lap out of nowhere. So the other thing I wanted to ask you was like, when you came to the conclusion of like smudging and stuff, did you already know about that? Or did you have to do some research into, cause like seriously, like this is a serious matter. Like you see something standing over you at night. It's not acting in a situation where like other things are moving in the same way, like shadows and whatnot. So you have to do something, right? So how did you come to the conclusion that you did to, to solve the problem? Well, what I've also been, I've also been a pastor before. And so I, I did all the Christian stuff to get it to go away and it didn't. And that shocked me because I've never been in a situation before where that didn't work. Really, I know a little bit about smudging before and about burning sage. I like burning it anyways because it smells nice and Palo Santo and stuff. But learning how to do the ritual correctly. And, you know, like at first I felt kind of silly doing it. But, you know, after I did it a couple of times, I just I felt finally that I was in control instead of at the mercy of this thing. And that that mindset, that shift from being a victim to doing something about it really helped change things. Yeah, that's really interesting because, you know, when you hear stories that people share, like, for example, with my stories that I went through, you don't really think of confronting it. You don't really think that like you're in control. It's like, I just want to survive this and get the fuck out of here (laughs) (laughs) as soon as I fucking can. So with that entity, Ryan, 
aside from it just standing there and just appearing to y'all, did it do anything? Did it ever get physical? Did it slam doors? How did you guys first encounter that thing? It just popped up. Uh, and I don't, I couldn't tell you why. I have no idea still to this day. I don't like being at the mercy of things, and especially when, you know, it's suddenly I'm having trouble sleeping. You know, I'm, I'm exhausted all the time. I feel drained. I tried sleeping in different areas to see if that would help, and it didn't. Lights would flicker. You could repeat it, and it would respond. I don't know if that was the same entity or a ghost. I couldn't tell. I know one day I came home after a really bad day at work and I was cooking something over to the stove and um, the light started flickering on me. And I was like, I, not today. Because I, I just said, can you fucking not? It actually stopped. And I was kind of surprised. But you start to notice all that stuff. And I, I don't know. I'm a fantasy writer. So I already kind of have my mind in those spaces anyways. So I was like, I'm not putting up with this. I like my sleep, you know? And I don't care how big and bad and old you are or whatever. I want to sleep and I want to live in peace. You have that encounter. What well, sounds like multiple encounters with whatever that entity was. Yeah. Was that your entrance into interacting with the paranormal or did no. things happen earlier on in your life that was like, holy crap, what the hell's um, going on? I'm also a childhood cancer survivor. So I've had near death experiences. So I don't know if you want me to go into that. If you're comfortable with sharing. Uh, I had a really rare form of childhood leukemia when I was about one and a half. I've died three times. I've um, been dead for over five minutes. One of the times that I died, I saw this blurry white field, people with white robes everywhere. Uh, and they all seemed familiar, but I couldn't quite tell who they were. And um, at the far edge of the field, there were these two figures standing there in white robes with their hoods up. I couldn't quite see their faces, but one had a red belt and a sword. And the other one reached out his hand to me. And without moving his lips, his voice kind of came from everywhere that said, that asked, do you want to live? And I tried to say yes, of course, I couldn't speak. Suddenly I was in front of those figures and the hand reaching out to me was pierced. So I've always taken the impression that it was Jesus because that's the figure that I can think of that was like that. And also it's in one of those weird situations where you just know, and I don't know how else to explain it other than that, but I woke up. I was alive. I wasn't supposed to live through the night. I was given a 10% chance to live. There was a little stuffed animal raccoon in my arms and no one had come in or out the whole night. So I still have it. I've actually heard similar stories, but the most amazing part to me is the fact that you were standing around seemingly on the other side of existence with a bunch of people, like a bunch of figures who, yeah. you know, I've heard story, similar stories. I'm sure you have too, where like yeah. they're cloaked. They look slightly different. They're not quite human yet. They're somehow to they're able to communicate, but it's not through voice. It's through some kind of like mind speak or like something that yeah. injects an idea into your head. I guess like just out of interest, like given your experiences and like not just your personal experience, but like what you've studied and gone through your entire life mm -hmm. with other people, have you come across similar experiences and, and, and like, especially the ones where it's like, Oh my God, this is like, this is lining up with exactly what I experienced. Yeah. So as a writer, one of the sources of inspiration I go to uh, is near death experiences. I just think they're fascinating. Um, and so, you know, you can't help but run into other similar experiences um, when you're researching. Yeah. I'm reminded of, I don't know if this has any bearing whatsoever, but there's a really um, famous YouTube video and there's a gentleman maybe you've seen him before but there's a gentleman who you know if you saw him on the street you'd probably never guess that someone would go through this experience because he seems like the the quintessential i think he's actually southern but like the quintessential southern gentleman guy like who just has you know like a normal life in america and um he just looks like a guy you would expect to, to see um grabbing a beer with his friends or something like he's probably yeah. in his like mid late 40s but he told this crazy story about how he i think he was a fireman and he, he passed away due to some complications of a fire, I think. And he was on the, the, uh, the operating table and he was telling the story about how, when he got to the other side, he experienced this like, like, like unbelievably white room. And there was a bearded guy that he took to be the leader. But then there were also these creatures around him that kind of looked like, I think he said like gnomes or, or like not, not actual, you know, like jolly, uh, uh, garden gnomes but like they looked different they were they were visually different they were shorter they didn't have the exact same facial features as a human does so they were clearly different mm -hmm. but i always thought that that story and then also considering your story being on the other side is interesting because it's almost like people report it like you would expect if someone died on the operating table or saw the other side 
they would project something that was more clearly defined in the terms of, of what they lived in. They would see mm. actual people, they would see actual buildings, but it's always twisted, right? Like it's always yeah. like the people they see are not quite people and the, the sounds they hear are not quite the sounds they hear on earth. And I think that like, you're probably the perfect person to talk about with this because you've experienced it and you've done research on it. And this is something we haven't talked about before with other people. So do you have any, do you want to delve into that at all? Is that, is that anything that you want to explore? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, I've noticed that too. in a lot of stories and also in my own experience is almost as like, like distance didn't matter. Like the normal rules of like reality that we're used to didn't matter. And I don't know what's up with that. It was really weird. It was like, well, like, you know, at one point I was on the far side of this field and then in a blink in a, in, in a second, I was standing in front of people. It was like, I wanted to go in front of them and suddenly I was there. So Ryan, I have a question. Yeah. When Before you went through that process, do you recall what it was like before you ended up in front of them? I only have a couple memories of having cancer because I was so young. But uh, for that one, I remember doctors were putting an oxygen mask over my face and I was screaming because I was scared. And then the next thing I knew, I was there. I'm just really fascinated by that because like Dean said, we never talked to someone that had an NDE before. And it's, you know, you're a trooper for being here right now, man. So like, honestly, but it's always interesting to hear NDE stories. The most common ones you hear are people going to hell, but yeah, <laughs> I don't think that's something anyone would want to experience. You went through that phase of your life very early on where you mm. were exposed to death. You were exposed to the paranormal. After that point, as you were growing up, what else did you encounter that you realized like, hey, this is kind of odd? I've always been a bit intuitive, I guess. I'll hear my name called in a crowd, but there's no one talking to me, which I've always thought was strange. And if I can ever find that person, it usually ends up being someone that needs I need to talk to, which is weird. And then I've always had really vi- vivid dreams after that. One time in college, I was biking back for my internship at night to, co- to back to my dorm. It's, it's out in rural Missouri. And I was taking a left out in the farm country and on my bike. And all of a sudden, this voice comes from somewhere off to my right. It says, hi, Ryan. And like, it was so normal. It was so normal and natural. I was like, oh, hi. And then I skidded to a stop (laughs) because I was like, this is midnight in the middle of nowhere. There's no one here, you know. Um, So I got back and uh, as I pulled into the parking lot, I saw this like dark figure like hovering over the school with its arms stretched out. It was so bizarre. And I saw it for like maybe five seconds and then it was gone. So I went in and I was trying trying to tell my roommates about it. And they're like, yeah, whatever. You know, like you're just making things up or whatever. I was like, no, like, I don't know how else to like convince you guys. This just stuff happens to me. And I don't know. I've kind of grown used to it, I guess. So I've had that happen. And then I've had more things happen in New Mexico as well, which I'm happy to get into as well. What do you think that being was? I mean, like a lot, a lot of times we talk about these things, somebody has, generally people have like some kind of semblance of, of what is going on, but have you ever actually given some thought into um, this or other experiences? Because it seems like you're more sensitive to what is happening in terms of like feeling these things out or like experiencing them. People are not usually capable of having those numerous experiences. But by the way, when I say sensitive, I mean like you're more sensitive to the interactions that these things are providing to you. So like, what, what do you think is going on? Because it seems like rare, it seems more rare that you're going through this. And it's so weird to me because I know other people have told me that too. Like, oh, this is that stuff's rare. And like, I've never had anything like that. And it's like, this stuff is kind of normal to me. And I'm not just, you know, saying that to, you know, trump myself up or anything but it's just the stuff keeps happening (laughs) and you know you got to do something about it anyways at some point i have no idea what that thing was uh to be honest even if it's just pissing you off or getting a rise out of you that's some that's some kind of thing that they're trying to get out of you and you can obviously go even deeper on the other end which is like oh it's trying to help you or trying to hurt you or something Mm -hmm. but ultimately if you're seeing these things and they're frequent and they're something that's just, you know, you can't escape. Like you have to admit at some point, something is coming to you for some reason. Yeah, and, for um, sure. 
And that's interesting, right? Because most of the people we've talked to so far, they have one-off experiences that happen, you know, occasionally throughout their lives, but it doesn't seem like the people we've talked to have some kind of something affixed to them in terms of a state of awareness of, of what some might see as the other side. So I guess the next thing I'd ask, like based off of your experiences, like what, what would you say is an instigator of something like that? Like, is there something that causes like the, the fact that somebody could see or experience something on the other side like you, or um, is it just kind of random? So I don't know. I have a couple of ideas about this and they're just ideas, you know, I'm not trying to say I'm the be all end all of anything, but um, I think that this stuff is real and it doesn't necessarily need us to trigger anything. I think that there are myriads of intelligent different types of entities and creatures and spirits and whatever else that are out there. You can fence yourself in, but you can't fence the world out sort of thing. Sometimes I think that we train ourselves to not see it for whatever reason. And and that's fine. You know, it's not like you want to see this stuff. I think that we train ourselves out of it. And so if I don't think if if you don't have an open mind to it, a lot of times you might encounter something, but you're able to brush it off somehow. Whereas, you know, I didn't really have a choice with the most of this stuff. It just happens. So trying to find a way to still live my life and yet deal with this stuff has been challenging, but also kind of empowering too, because it's taught me a lot about these different creatures based on other people's stories, based off of the research that I've done, based off of the writing that I've done. I love local history. And so I like to pick up patterns whenever I can, that sort of stuff. You know, you, you said something really important there. You know, people try to brush it off. The most common thing you'll hear is, oh, it's just the house settling. Right. Oh, it's just the wind. Oh, it's just your imagination. You were you were thinking about someone, you know, calling out your name. You were thinking about that person and your subconscious somehow played that into your mind. You know, there there's so many excuses that people come up with. And the longer the list grows, the more facetious it gets. Right. <laughs> Where people right. try to be accusatory. You know, the worst thing you could do is especially someone like yourself that literally died. And came back. And now that personally, I think your experience with your NDE allowed you to have more of an ability to view the other side. I've wondered about that too. Yeah, because I I mean, like you said, some people can suppress it. I do have a cousin that he is sensitive. He was very sensitive at a very young age. And there was an incident going on where it was negative and he saw like these black flies just flying around and he said he closed his eyes and said to whatever controls this i don't want to see this anymore i don't want this gift and like clockwork it just went away he hasn't seen anything if you try to talk to him about ghosts or anything like that he'll get freaked out because he thinks it'll just reawaken the ability for him to see and experience this type of stuff but i definitely think there's some correlation to what you went through as a child, that very traumatic experience of surviving cancer, you know, passing away and coming back, actually getting a glimpse into the other side. I think, you know, when stuff like that happens, people, whether they like it or not, they're, they're more susceptible to seeing through the veil of what's on the other side. But before we jump into uh, your experiences in New Mexico, Uh, You mentioned that, you know, you did research on this and you said that, you know, in your opinion, there's a lot of like spirits and creatures and stuff that you've found in your research. You you mind going into a little bit of that? Yeah, sure. And it's something I've been trying to write, actually. It's just hard because I feel like it's such a big topic. I'll look at everything from mythology to local history. I love listening to paranormal podcasts because it's it's not so much that I need validation. It's more of like, this stuff happens all the time. Like, and and we live in a bigger world than we could possibly imagine. And to think that someone's got it buttoned down is just madness. Uh, at least I think so. When I encountered the shadow person, for example, I had already been familiar with shadow people because I had listened to podcasts and I had talked to people. Um, and so putting together kind of the breadcrumb trail of these different things, especially when, you know, you're the one experiencing it and you want to understand 
what it is as much as you can and why it's happening. Maybe that's huge for me. It's interesting. We are talking along these lines today because I actually had a, a thought that, that falls in line with what we're talking about. It's the first time I ever had this thought, which is really weird, honestly, that, that it aligns with our conversation. Cause it usually, you know, it's something that would be a one-off uh, thing that would pop into my head, but otherwise it, it seems to fit with our conversation. And that's like, so, you know, we've heard stories where, individuals have i think there's one guy that's been documented at least we've seen in like mainstream recent documentaries and stuff where he has a really sensitive nose and um you can probably look this up like there's there's a guy who has been documented by actual scientific methods to have a nose that is capable of smelling smells that are almost or like you know near the capability that a dog would have say like an average dog but we know that humans on average don't have the sensitivities of smell that a dog has, right? I mean, that's just, that's just um, part of our physiology. What I'm saying is there are aspects of our development um, within the realm of beings that exist on this planet that seem to be more localized or focused than the average. So if you have a guy who can smell, I don't know, like a hundredth of sensitivity that, that the average person can smell, why would you not consider scientifically that there are people who have more sensitive parts of them that would pick up on something that is less understood, like electromagnetism or something like that, scientifically that says like, oh, this is something real. Like there is some kind of physiology within these beings that can read that or interpret that. Yeah, no, totally. I, it's just you were talking and I... I used to work at a gas station for a while and uh, full moons are a thing. I don't care what anybody else says, but people get crazy on full moons. I've, I've had friends who worked in hospitals and they, it's always crazy for them whenever a full moon happens. And it's just like, this is, you know, just like animals disappearing for a storm, you know, and all that stuff. Definitely think that sensitivity, specialized sensitivity is something that people can have. And I feel like it needs to be given more credence. So I think um, what I what would be interesting now would be to maybe talk about the locations that you've lived in, right? So you've you've had these these um, very intense experiences, and you've had individuals in your life who you've reported this to, and some believe, some don't. Yeah. But what do you think are some of the most interesting stories on a broader scale in the places you've lived? Have you ever investigated something outside of your experience? So I've only done a little bit of that, to be honest. Something that I really want to get into, I don't know if you guys have covered it yet or not, is Momo, um, the Missouri monster. It, it's Sasquatch. Um, but that happened in Louisiana, Missouri, which is just 10 miles down the road. And I've always wanted to just poke my head down. I don't know who to talk to, but like I want, I know there are still people living who are, who are there when it happened. And I would absolutely love to, uh, to get their first, I, I love firsthand take, like, you know, when I'm researching, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for firsthand experiences. I have experienced stuff with ghosts, um, other people's haunted stuff. I've been able to go to pagan groups and their different rituals, and that's been fascinating. Um, I don't know where where to begin, but yes, the answer is yes. Let's let's do. Um, can we do Momo? Because I've never yeah. actually heard of that version of Sasquatch. And this, this might be really interesting to hear about after yeah, Momo. Sure. I'd be interested in hearing about the pagan stuff. And I'm, I'm going off of memory here. So if I get something wrong, I'm sorry. Um, so in the seventies in Louisiana, Missouri, which is just South of Hannibal, Missouri, where I live, basically uh, a family started getting terrorized by the Sasquatch creature to the point of, they had to like flee their home from it. Like word got around, people started saying, "Hey, I've had encounters too." Basically, the whole town decided to to this is Missouri, so they all got their guns and they were wandering around town looking for this thing, like you know, classic like torches and pitchforks. The cops were trying to get people to like not do that because it was dangerous because somebody could just get shot. And it it went on for a good long time, but for a while, this whole town was swarmed by people hunting for Sasquatch because of all the stories that were happening. So they never found anything other than, you know, the people who had experienced things. But I've heard other local stories about Sasquatch in Missouri, too. I kind of wonder is connected, you know, because they're similar stories and they have similar little tidbits to them. Honestly, when I heard Momo, I thought it was going to be about the um, the more recent um, Japanese thing. phenomena. Oh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know what the I'm talking Momo. about? 
Yeah. yeah. It's like a, almost like a, a newer version of Slender Man where something is more modern, but it really affects people psychologically because it's so freaky. I, you know, I've never heard of Momo as from the Sasquatch perspective. And that particular story is interesting because you have a whole town seemingly having experiences. And um, I mean, not the whole town, right? Like we can, we can always talk, we can always break it down and say, well, it could have been a few handful of individuals. We all know that stories kind of like explode through the grapevine and people get really riled up. We've actually heard, we've talked to people before who have had similar experiences where like a certain town has like a few people have seen something and things kind of got out of hand and there was no actual evidence that something really existed, but they got into a lot of trouble trying to find it. Right. I would be really interested, Ryan, in finding out what the firsthand accounts are of such a story, because if they are consistent, um, then you might have something significant there. But then also you have to ask like, well, this, this happened a while ago. If it's not repeatable, and the the being was actually there. The Sasquatch was there. Did it move on? Did you know? Did something happen to where it was uh, moved out of the area, or did it just become more elusive because it was aware that it got caught one time already? So, like those are some those are some questions I would ask when I was asking the townspeople about such an experience. In, in my opinion, uh, I think the Sasquatch is intelligent. I think that they they've got to have a huge range of area that they actually cover just be given the nature of the creature that's usually described. And I don't know if it just moved on or if it left or if there was more than one. I, I have no idea. Ryan, I did want to segue into something you said earlier about pagan rituals. Mm -hmm. So you said you were a pastor before, right? Yeah. So I'm assuming like that's Christian. Like what yeah. was there a specific denomination that you no, were? No, non-denominational non-denominational at what point did you observe pagan rituals what drew you to them sure so actually it was the fantasy writing i read a lot of celtic mythology i'm 65 percent irish one day when i was reading i realized that these are my people's stories and uh like a, a celtic historian i love peter beresford ellis said in one of his books look these ways of life and these celebrations and these holidays that people usually just write off as pagan. Um, they have their roots in historical Celtic life and Irish life. And I have a place in that. And that blew my mind because before that, I don't know, I never really felt rooted to something. And so being able to say, Hey, like these are my people and I'm in those stories somewhere through my ancestors just blew my mind. And so I started celebrating the Celtic holidays. So we're coming up on Samhain, you know, Halloween. I really got into it. And I found that being connected to the earth and the land and the seasons really helped me. Like, for example, winter's coming. Winter's a time for rest. But like the whole land rests in winter. And we ought to be resting too. However that is, however that means for us in this modern society. But giving yourself, allowing yourself to breathe you know, and to just not be up with the hectic pandemonium that happens, you know, throughout the year, regardless of the season. It's just, I don't know. Once I learned that, it really helped clear up a lot of things for me. I was down at my local pub down here. Uh, it's an Irish pub. And so I'll go down there on Fridays for live music because it's fun. And I um, ended up talking to some other regulars there who they have a group of, of pagans who go, they live here just north of town. And they have rituals and they celebrate the different Celtic holidays. And I was like, yeah, I'm down into that. And they, they brew their own beer and they're just awesome people by being able to be a part of their circle um, and to go through those different rituals and actually celebrate those holidays from, for me, not so much a religious perspective, but more of like a cultural perspective, spiritual, but not religious perspective has been fascinating. And I, I they're, they're wonderful people. I love them to death. And it's also helped to give me a sense of wholeness. And so uh, learning more about it, keeping an open mind about things that, especially things that, you know, I wasn't raised in, that stuff fascinates me. That stuff doesn't, doesn't scare me away. It doesn't shut me down. I want to know more. I am a huge fan of author George MacDonald. He was the one who inspired Lewis Carroll. And uh, he was uh, inspiration for C.S. Lewis and Tolkien. Oh, one of the you. things he said... <laughs> Yeah, no, sweet. If you get, ever get a chance to read his stuff, uh, fantasies is really good. But anyways, he said all truth is God's truth. 
And I love that. And so whenever you can find light somewhere, when you can find goodness, I think is it's the fingerprint of God or gods, whatever you believe in. And so finding another little source of it has been illuminating. I have kind of a two-part question for you, okay. Ryan. Once you started getting involved with those rituals, what do they entail? Sure. And, and it, yeah. yeah. Sorry, <laughs> and and the other part of that question I'm assuming you're still actively involved in like yeah. in that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. How did that affect your, I guess, interaction with the paranormal now? Sure. Well, it, it gives you more context, I, I feel, because this is a group of people that are, are open-minded, that have all had their own experiences that, that welcome that and relish that. That really helped me to kind of normalize how sensitive I am with these things, apparently. Um, to know that I'm not alone, to know that, you know, there's other people out there that are fascinated by this stuff too, that, that are real people that I can go hang out with and I can talk to. I was just over at the main guy's house last week for a barbecue. It was great. But with the rituals, I'm just going to take out some of the, like the Hollywood stuff to it. There, there's, there's no crazy sacrificing and all that stuff. You know, there's no cauldrons. There's none of that. I mean, unless, unless they're making stew, there's no cauldrons. You know, so a typical a typical gathering, like for Salon, for example, uh, they'll do opening ritual. Uh, we'll wait till the sun goes down, and we'll have a big fire, and just because it's cold out, you know. And um, there are certain ritual phrases that you'll say to each other as you're entering the circle. Certain people are responsible for calling in the four directions for greeting the the fae. For greeting to the spirits of the land. Sometimes they'll invoke a certain god or goddess, depending on what they want to theme things around, which I find fascinating too. So you'll be in a big circle around a fire. You'll do those rituals where you call in and you invoke those things for your... Th it, the, the rituals, the, they last about three days. So, But that's not all like hard ritual stuff. It's a lot of times just hanging out, having a beer, having some barbecue, you know, just having good conversations with people. Uh, it's a community. That's what it really is. And I feel like, you know, if you don't have community, you're doing something wrong. But it's about lifting each other up and about helping to expand what you're searching for um, and friendship, to be honest. I know that sounds kind of hallmarky, but it seems like older structural religions, and I'm not talking just about Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking about all the major religions and even some sub religions <clears throat> but like like we know more now as human beings historically than we've ever known and even if you brush aside the the strangely odd conspiratorial things that are flying around nowadays in our modern society about like the um the advent of humanity how long humanity's been around like if if uh if the world is flat like i don't want to you know i'm sorry like i don't want to get into like that crazy stuff but like what i'm trying to say is we live in a time and a place where things don't say the um, world is flat and JJ will probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just so we're on, just so we're all on the same page. No, um, but the only reason I bring that up and it's funny in a sense is because we do live in this time where even if you want to believe that sort of thing, you cannot deny the fact that historically speaking through all kinds of layers of records, not just one source of records, but multiple layers for, of records from multiple sources where we have individuals who have believed, who have come to the conclusion that scientifically we're supposed to be at now, like the world is round or whatever you want to add in there, whatever scientific method, whatever scientific um, conclusion. But what's fascinating to me about religion is it's kind of flip-flopped, right? Like, whereas if you go a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago, people did not have, the average person didn't have access that we have now. Right. So we have access to all this crazy information, depths, depths of knowledge and, and information to the degree we have now to where we can actually say, hmm, well, let's let's think about Solomon. Let's think about Wiccan. Let's think about paganism, because yeah. historically speaking, it's been kind of subjugated for, for, for various reasons. And I know there's all kinds of people who can argue all kinds of things and sure. not trying to get into the argument side. But what I am trying to raise as a consideration is we're all people who are existing in this time period we exist in and we don't know shit, right? Like, no, I don't care who you are. You have faith. If you, you can have faith, if you want, there's no, I'm not going to try to shoot holes in that, but you also, if you have faith, have to admit that there are other aspects 
of humanity that are not being considered in, if you don't consider them, you're missing out in my opinion. So it yeah. sounds like that's where you've come to with your conclusion. And I respect that. That's awesome. That's a great, that's a rare thing nowadays. Here we are. We started the show. You started with your paranormal experiences, encountering a shadow person, and then we segued to NDEs, fucking yeah. Bigfoot, <laughs> and now we're talking about Celtic beliefs. And, and, and by the and by the way, by the way, we've never had great. a trans person on. We've never had a trans person on the show before. So you're the first, which is hey, yeah, cool. So that's that's awesome, man. Like it's great to uh, share whatever experience anyone has. Like we want to hear about it. Like so, it's yeah. it's uh, non judgmental. So completely open and it's actually really fascinating because we're learning too because i i know from listening to other stories that you know negativity tends to attract negative things and so it helps to be aware of things and to be aware when those negative things are happening and then also know how to deal with it like with that shadow person if i had just done the christian stuff and it didn't work like what do what was I supposed to do is like hitting, hitting my head against the wall. I'm okay with trying other things, especially if they're known to work, if they're there to help and they're good, then of course I want to, I want to see if it helps. And I love being able to share stuff like that with other people. Odds are we're all going through something. And when it hits the head, spooky things can happen. And I think being aware of that and not just brushing it off, like it's an automatic response, but dealing with it, in a good way, in a positive way, I think we need to see more of that. Yeah, I I completely agree, especially with the whole negativity stuff. Like it, these things, whatever they are. Correct me if I'm wrong. In your in your beliefs, they're elementals, they're fairies, yeah, fays. You know, we talked to. I don't know if you listened to episode fifty. My buddy Trev over in Ireland comes on the show to share some experiences, and we talk about fairies and all of that fun stuff. Okay, so I think you. If you haven't listened to it yet, I think you'd enjoy that. I'm, I'm working my way down with with Trev. Yeah, yeah. but I, I really think that there is something to that because we also had someone from Northern Ireland reach out to us. If you remember, Dean, we had Connor reach out to us who went through a lot of negativity through childhood all the way up to his adult life where he was harassed by shadow people or. At one point, it seemed like a demon was coming after him, trying to kill him, trying to take his life force. So I really think that is a real thing. Some people are unfortunate in the sense that they see these things. I personally think that even if you're not sensitive to it, it still can affect you, but you just can't see it. Yeah, and seeing is only one one sense. You know, so many people are like, well, where's the photographs? Where's the video? It's not like everybody has oh, something spooky happens. The first thing I'm going to do is whip my phone out. You know, it's just either it's not convenient or whatever. But, but seeing is only one sense. And I think that it's important to remember that because not everything is going to be, you know, a picture perfect go on top documentary style that we want. I think that a lot of times we're used to these stories having resolution. And sometimes there isn't. And I feel like that can be unsettling, but it's the truth. This ties back exactly to what we were saying earlier, which is when people are experiencing certain things, there's not necessarily a clear pathway to explaining them. So, Chris, we've talked about this to people a million times before where like it's like, you know, why, for example, why do uh, guys like if something comes along with me, like to me and like presents itself, I don't want to be a badass, but I'll just be like, shit, I got a million other things I got to worry about. And, and Chris, you've said this before where like you talk to your dad who lived in this house where you've had these experiences that were paranormal and you asked him later and he was like, yeah, I didn't have time for that. Like I, I right. didn't have time yeah. to deal with that. Yeah. So and, it's the same our thing. Guest right? Last week, Elizabeth, same she thing, was right? like, yeah, same thing. She's like, yeah, my dad like had experiences, but he's like, like, fuck, I got shit to do. I got bills to pay. Like I can't, I don't got to deal with no fucking ghosts. Like what the hell? <laughs> I have time for this. I honestly think like that is within the vein of what we're talking about. It's like, like anybody who's dealing with whatever they're trying to focus on their immediate lives and survive or thrive or both. I would have to say, I would guarantee that if people are having some kind of experiences that are unexplainable, at least 50%, if not more are writing it off and not reporting it, not talking about it. Like if you have a group of friends where, you know, none of them have any respect whatsoever for a paranormal investigation or experience, 
you would be up a creek without a paddle if you had some blob of black show up in the corner of your room like hovering over you and you yeah. knew you were lucid you weren't on any drugs like you know whatever like you know how would you what would you do you would just completely write it off especially if it didn't hurt you so um i i think that there's a lot of things out there across multiple regions uh cultures even time periods over the last like however many thousands of years like people just don't report that sort of thing so it's always fun to talk about what's actually going on sometimes i'll get a little nudge that like hey you should go this way instead of that way and so i've tried to like make a point to listen to that voice and i don't i I know one time i missed a big big bad wreck because i i listened to it i was listening i was living in albuquerque then and uh i was heading downtown to my favorite bar and i usually go this one way um, cause it's the most direct route, but I was like, for some reason I was like, you know what, I'm going to go this other way. And it was only till I got to the bar and people were like, did you hear about the big wreck that just happened? And I was like, shit, that, that was the way I would have gone. <laughs> you know, what scares me and no, no one talks like normally we would just hear this story and be like, oh, that's great. You avoided some kind of tragedy, but I can't help but wonder. And it would be interesting to hear your perspective, Ryan. Mm-hmm. What about something that's reaching out to certain people? to make certain decisions or to guide certain people in, in a pathway, like how would you, this is, this is probably getting too heavy for, for this podcast, but I can't help but ask it. It's like, how would you rectify that? I wish, I wish there would, there would have been like a, a scientific way to, you know, gather everybody together and say, Hey, like, first of all, I mean, you have to believe in this stuff, you know, and not just dismiss it because it's so Mm -hmm. easy to dismiss that little voice in your head. Um, but, but, to, to actually see if those people did get that little voice in their head. Um, and if enough yeah. people involved in the accident did, that would be crazy. That would be yeah, something that'd be that I'd be, yeah, I'd be all into that. I, I mean, I mean, not for the wreck, but just for the, the, everybody saying the same thing. And if enough people were saying the same thing, you know, pay attention to it. Yeah. I mean, we kind of get that nowadays, right. With like, um, there are actually some organized scientific studies, not necessarily mainstream, but lesser known studies where people get into a room and they all focus on some prayer or something. And like, you know, people, I know there's like, like a famous point in Christianity. It's like, Oh, prayer changes things. But there, there are actually studies outside of the context of Christianity that is not funded by Christianity mm-hmm. where it, it seems like, you know, if you get a group of people in a room focusing on a subject or something, something similar, they're all sharing a similar mind. Uh, something strange happens. It's like some kind of reading, some kind of electromagnetic reading is increasing or something like that. Even as far as to say that some people think that, and then like the things play out. I mean, have you come across that at all, Ryan? Yeah. I, I, I would, I would put it in the context of spirit. I feel like when you're in a group of people that share one spirit, you, you tend to have the same sorts of things in mind. And that's one of the reasons that I, I love, I love hanging out with, with my pagan group because they share one spirit. Um, they're interested in, in similar things and similar things that tend to happen to them. I would like to take this opportunity to segue into your New Mexico uh, paranormal experiences. Okay. Yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I shared that little bit about the, the, uh, the shadow person, but I, I know one of the big things that I, that I reached out to you about was a La Llorona story. And so if you're not familiar with La Llorona, there's lots of different versions of the myth, the legend, but there's something to it, but of, of a wailing woman that likes to drown children in, uh, drainage ditches because she's searching for her lost children. For whatever reason, that's where the story is kind of divide on. But um, my then wife and I were coming back from, I think, having dinner or something. And so we live in this little casita and this little hobby farm. And um, so there's a gate out front and we're pulling up to it. And um, we had the windows down and it was in the fall. All of a sudden, like everything goes deathly quiet, like the crickets stop, the birds, all the nightlife just, just goes deathly quiet. And we're like, what in the world is happening? And all of a sudden we, we hear this cry and it's not coyote. It's not a screech owl or something like, you know, the difference, like it's something that I, when I was sharing the story on um, real life ghost stories, um, it's something that you felt on your skin. 
before you heard it with your ears. Like it was that kind of cry. And of course I have to pop out to open up this dumb gate because it's locked and this is happening right then. And the last thing I want to do is be out in the open when this is happening. So I run out, I open the lock, I whip open the gate and I pop back in the car and we have to go through. And then I realize I have to get out again because I have to shut the damn gate. <laughs> and this is just happening. It's still happening. And, and like, I want nothing to do with this. And so we finally pull up to our little house and um, we get inside and we lock the doors. Like, it doesn't matter that we're on like a farm and there's nobody around. Like, we, whatever it was, we want it to stay outside. Um, and so a little bit of backstory to this which was really fascinating is uh there's a local podcast called Dos Pequeños and um which is a comedy paranormal podcast there in New Mexico. Uh Eric Carter Landine's one of the co-hosts. He's awesome. We live near an elementary school and 30 years ago a kid disappeared. A kid was found in the drainage ditch. And like nobody likes to talk about it and like we live maybe I don't I don't mean to cut you off, Ryan, yeah. but is there any water located by any bodies of water in your vicinity? Cause when I think New Mexico, I think desert. Oh no, we're right by the Rio Grande. We're like maybe oh. two, two miles from the Rio Grande. Okay. Yeah. So all these drainage ditches come, come off of the river. I heard that story and then that happened to me and I was like, well, crap, that was, I'm pretty sure that was La Llorona. And I went, I popped on YouTube and I was hunting around for other, you know, La Llorona, you know, experiences and a couple of them out of Mexico that are on there that you can find. It was a dead ringer for what I heard, which like made the hairs on the back of my neck go up, you know. Now, did you just hear screaming or did you hear the prototypical? Some people say you'll hear a woman weeping. You you, you hear that in some, some of the Mexican oh, stuff on YouTube. And it just this was like the mix between a cry and a screech. Yeah, we didn't hang around to see what else she was going to say. Yeah, I have always been fascinated by La Llorona. Dean, we did an episode a while back about, you know, the concept of the weeping women throughout other cultures. It's fascinating that there's so many cultures that have never interacted with each other in the past. But yeah, not just not thing. just South and Central, right? It's like Asia, Asia, Asia you know, South Japan. Asia. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like all over the world. I, I got into that that same mindset with parallel myths. You know, the reason that, you know, we all talk about dragons or we all talk about giants or we all whatever is maybe because there's something to it. No, I'm of the same mind. I, I, I really do think there's something to that. Yeah. That, you know, the concept of a cyclops, the concept of giants, the concept of dragons and other mythological creatures. You had the encounter with La Llorona. Mm -hmm. fucking terrifying yeah if you think about human history it's the same thing like we don't address these questions like you were saying like we used to think they were dragons no one used to consider what else they could be so when you constrain yourself to something you kind of create this so-called you know like quote-unquote monster and who knows how that affects you know the actual world around us with these experiences it's it, it it's frankly it's terrifying with like talpas uh, things we manifest and all that stuff. And that's just like, that's a long winded way of saying, you know, we have no idea what's going on, but like things are clearly happening. It could be something deep seated from our childhood. It could be something we manifest as, as we get older. It could be a mixture of both. So Ryan, what else did you encounter while you were living in New Mexico? So really crazy story. I used to work at this camp called El Porvenir. It's up in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains outside of Las Vegas, New Mexico. And I used to work up there as an intern. So I worked up there for two different summers. I had been a camper there too. I love that place. Uh, and you, by the way, you can rent cabins in the off season and it's awesome. So I like to go up there to get away to write and stuff. But anyways, I was up there and I was working. They still have the old chow hall there. And so the old chow hall has been there since like the pioneer days, like the Cowboys. It used to be a hotel. The Catholic church owned it at one point. It was almost like a town at one point. Anyways, a lot of stuff has happened there. It, it's burned down twice. They built a new chow hall, so people don't really use it anymore. But you can still go in and the fireplaces kick ass and all that. 
Two different things have happened to me there. I'll start with the smaller story and then I'll get into the bigger, juicier one. We were up there for a work weekend once, my friend Andrew and I, and we were in there by the fireplace because it was in the winter and it was snowing and stuff and we were cold and we were warming up. And and uh, the, the door to the left of us opened up to the old mail room and uh, we had just finished winterizing that building. So like there's no drafts, there's no nothing, everything's sealed and we're sitting there talking and the door creaks open halfway like by itself and we're like well that's weird and we're like staring at it and then we're staring at it and it slams shut hard and we're like what in the world and it's like maybe 10 feet away from us and we're just watching it now because like what the hell is it doing and uh, then it starts wagging back and forth like i'm not making this up it's like something out of a movie it starts like wagging back and forth and then sometimes it would do like a hard stop in the middle of the swing i don't know if we're just goofy but like we just thought it was funny (laughs) because it was being kind of comical i guess and we're like well that's great uh we need to go now but you have fun thanks for the show and we we, and we left we saw a door just like wagging like not like creaking back and forth but like hard whipping and then like stopping hard in the middle and stuff so totally bizarre so that's the first story i have from there the second one is so there's something in that building Nobody knows what it is. Tons of people have encountered it up there. It's like this inky black thing that's in there and it stares at you and it just makes you feel horrified and terrified. And it kind of almost like leers at you when you walk by. And I had to walk by the stupid building at night every night to go to my door. (laughs) And so I had to get spooked every night, every stupid night from this thing. And for, for two years in the summer and the second summer, I had enough. Uh, enough. I was like, I one day I just stopped. I stopped and, and I, it was night, and I found the darkest patch of of space in there I could. And I looked into the window, and and then I was like, Look, I know you're there. I know you're big and bad and spooky, but honestly, I just want to go to bed. I I don't care what you are. I don't care that you're scary. Um, you apparently can't leave the building, so I'm safe, and I'm gonna go to bed. And every time after that, I would walk by and I would talk to it. I'd be like, hey, what's up? You scare some people today? Like, do you have nothing better to do? I could feel it go from like scary and like foreboding to like annoyed, um, which was hilarious. because That's the only time I can think of that I pissed off something, but like not in a scary, dangerous way, just a funny way. But it, it took the bite out of it. And I feel like when you're able to laugh at something, you take away the fear, that context. Because fear yeah. can be really powerful and it can get in your head and mess with you. But when, again, you find a way to take control of the situation in, in a safe way, because there are there are things out there that are, are legitimately dangerous that I'm not, you know, saying you should you should be dumb around that stuff. But for this case, it seemed to be fine. If you're able to change the context of a situation um, and make it something lighthearted, uh, it's night and day. Here's uh, something that that might be also in the wheelhouse for Chris, but you know we all know, especially within the Roman Catholic Church, we have uh, like a, they have a lot of instances of. I mean, it's not just Catholic, but it's also any religion. But like demons and uh, all kinds of things that need to be addressed religiously. Yeah. You've seen mm-hmm. both sides, like we've said before. What do you think, from your perspective now? What do you think is happening with these so-called evil entities that are trying to possess people? The big thing that I want to start with is that I feel like it's it's a very dangerous mistake to think that either there is nothing or to think that there is only angels and demons and that's it. Um, I think that that's very dangerous to, 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 to think that way because there's a whole plethora of a world of stuff out there. And some of those things can possess yeah, I've even heard stories of ghosts trying to possess people, and those those aren't demons; those are the departed spirits of people that want a body back, I guess you know, or however you you choose to you know interpret that. I would say that first, and then uh, secondly, I'd say is don't take chances. If you're getting scratch marks, if you're smelling sulfur, that's the hallmark of a demon. You need professional help. I would go to the Catholic Church. Don't mess around with this stuff. Don't don't think that this is a game. 
Um, don't play with Ouija boards, you guys. Uh, <laughs> Chris Thank you. Favorite. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> don't play with Ouija boards. It's like, do you want pain? Like, do you want evil? Do you want bad things <laughs> to happen to you? This isn't a game. Like, it may say age is eight and up, but it's not, you know? So, by the way, real, real quick, real quick, yeah. imagine you're a company who's just trying to make money. <laughs> <laughs> like people like spooky stuff. Let's, let's just make something that like, you know, gets people interested. And then you inadvertently create a portal to hell. Like, like what, like, you know, <laughs> like what, what better representation of capitalism do we have? Seriously. Right. We even found a way to monetize the supernatural. <laughs> <laughs> take that satan <laughs> <laughs> right so yeah but this stuff is real and you need to be careful and i would i'm not saying live in fear i think knowledge is power i think that it's only light that drives out darkness is only truth that that drives out lies if stuff is happening don't live in that fear for any longer than you have to do something about it and and if you need to get help get help if you need to talk to somebody, talk to somebody. Not everybody's going to think you're crazy. There's there's tons of people out there who have an open mind about this stuff that want to help or at least listen. You're not alone. You're dealing with something real. You need to get professionals to help you. The last question that I have for you today, and I think this will enjoy this one. Mm-hmm. You mentioned do not play with Ouija boards. Yeah. What are your thoughts on tarot, Ouija boards? And all the divination stuff that people like to do as a fad now, you'll find them on TikTok a lot. So I think there's a big difference between Ouija boards um, and different denomination things like tarot. Um, I Because a lot of people in my pagan group do practice tarot. They're tools to be used by professionals. And I don't mean it to be in a restrictive way because it is really cool. And nine times out of 10, I found that I've had insights from different readings that I've had. I, and also, I, I own runes. I know how to cast runes. Even if you don't believe in the stuff so much, but just to give yourself a different perspective, you know, on maybe what you're going through right now in your life, thoughts you might have been having, stuff that you've been through. I think if there's light and there's knowledge there, you should listen to it. But if if it's being just messed around with, it's just the same as not using a tool right, you know? A car is a wonderful thing, but you don't want to use it to go hurting people. You know, you you use a screwdriver for driving in screws. You don't use it for trying to fix your toaster. (laughs) You know, know what you're doing with this stuff. Don't just do it flippantly. Don't do it because it's a fad. Ryan, thank you so much for being on today's show. Thanks for having Uh, me. Oh, absolutely. This has been a real fun conversation. We did mention earlier in the podcast that you you were a former podcast host, a mm-hmm. former radio host, and you are an author. So why don't you tell the listeners of where they could find you in your writings? So I'm, I'm Ryan P. Freeman. I have 18 books out. I'm writing more. My website is ryanpfreeman.com. You can also find me on all the different socials, Ryan P. Freeman. That's me. So I have fantasy books out. I have a comedic book on writing. I was part of an award-winning military historical compilation book that is called New Mexico Remembers 9-11. So that's a really good read if you want something. If you're just looking for a good fantasy read, come come check out my stuff. You heard him there, folks. If you enjoy reading fantasy, go ahead and check out his writings. Ryan, once again, thank you for being a guest tonight. And to the listeners, thank you for listening to today's episode. If you made it this far, we really appreciate it. Like Dina and I always like to say, we are open to talking to anybody. Anyone is welcome to the show to share their paranormal experiences, cryptid stories, anything of that sort. Love interfacing with the community. We love talking to people. So if this is something you want to do, go ahead and reach out to us like Ryan did today. Thanks for tuning into today's episode of The Wandering Road. You can find us on Apple, Google, Spotify, and most podcast platforms. Be sure to subscribe and share. Also, don't forget to give a follow on Instagram at TWRoadPodcast and follow my TikTok at TWRPodcast. Take care, and I'll catch you on the next one.